From anatomy to anesthesiology, from pathology to pharmacology, from microbiology to medicine, a one-man resource to the world of health sciences. Welcome to Dr. Paul's Medical Lectures. A practicing physician, Dr. Paul offers you essential insights on diseases afflicting millions of people around the world. For today's lecture, here is Dr. Paul. And girls, of course. Today I want to talk a few minutes about uh, hyponatremia. Hyponatremia is uh, a very, very important factor, a very, very common diagnosis. So I want to spend some time describing hyponatremia this morning. And always remember that, that patient's volume status and serum osmolality are very important to think about when you see a patient with hyponatremia. So when you see a hyponatremia, low sodium level, just do not treat it. Before you treat it, think about volume status of the patient and serum osmolality. These two are very, very important. We usually say that the uh, patient has hyponatremia when the serum sodium concentration is less than 135 milliequivalents per liter. That's the number we, you need to remember. And most commonly we see hyponatremia in hospitalized patients. So, hyponatremia is very, very important. And you should treat it very carefully because you, mismanagement, if you do not treat it well, you can cause serious damage. There is a condition called cerebral pontine myelinosis. With, uh, when you treat hyponatremia aggressively or inappropriately, you can cause this uh, serious condition. So treating hyponatremia carelessly can cause more damage than hyponatremia itself. So that's why we should carefully evaluate the patient when we see a patient with uh, hyponatremia. And the other thing is you can have hyponatremia even with a high sodium level. In other words, the total sodium level is uh, not related to hyponatremia. Or I, uh, let me say like this, hyponatremia is not a reflection of total sodium in the body. In other words, you can have hyponatremia with a low total body sodium or normal total body sodium or even high total body sodium. So the hyponatremia is more a symptom of uh, water imbalance than sodium imbalance. That's a very important point. It's more a problem of water imbalance. Now let me first classify this. There is isotonic hyponatremia, hypertonic hyponatremia, and hypotonic hyponatremia. And these three things, they differ, and the etiology differ. And the classification is important to keep in mind the different causes that causes hyponatremia. Now, isotonic hyponatremia, where do you see it? You see it in a severe hyperlipidemia and hyperproteinemia. The lipids... The lipids like uh, cholesterol or chylomicrons or proteins like uh, immunoglobulin when you give intravenous immunoglobulin, what they do is they interfere with the measurement of serum sodium. And as a result you see low sodium level. That's why they cause pseudohyponatremia. But serum osmolality is isotonic because lipids and proteins they do not interfere with the serum osmolality. So lipids and proteins can cause pseudohyponatremia and we, we say it is as isotonic hyponatremia because they do not impact the serum osmolality. So you got the point folks. Lipids and proteins cause isotonic hyponatremia. Next, hypertonic hyponatremia. Hypertonic hyponatremia, it occurs with uh, hyperglycemia 
and mannitol administration. Remember those two things. Hyperglycemia and mannitol administration. You remember we give mannitol when there is increased intracranial pressure. What glucose and mannitol does, they pull the water from intracellular place to extracellular place. So a lot of water comes from intracellular place to extracellular place. Where the sodium stays? So sodium stays in the extracellular space. Because of this uh, translocation of water, the water volume increases and sodium level drops and that causes hyponatremia. So glucose and mannitol cause translocational hyponatremia and that is not pseudo hyponatremia we see in proteins and uh, lipids. This is a true hyponatremia because water came out and diluted the extracellular space. That's why when you see hyperglycemia and hyponatremia you should always use a correctional factor. For example when the glucose level goes up then you sh that means there is this translocational hyponatremia, so you should add a correctional factor for sodium. Whenever you see a high glucose level, you use like 2.4 milliequivalents per liter for every 100 milligrams deciliter increase in glucose. So my point is hyperglycemia and hyponatremia, when you see them together, you should always use correction fact. Remember this, this will help you in your residency and medical practice. So, we have been talking about uh, hypotonic hyponatremia and uh, hypertonic hyponatremia and isotonic. Finally, let us talk about hypotonic hyponatremia. Now, hypotonic hyponatremia is the most common cause of hyponatremia. Hypotonic hyponatremia, probably you see this more than you see anything else. Because most often we give fluids, hypotonic fluids to patients. And many diseases cause hypotonicity. So, hypotonic hyponatremia is again divided into three parts. I will talk about that in my next lecture. So remember these three things. Number one, isotonic hyponatremia. Number two, hypertonic hyponatremia. Number three, hypotonic hyponatremia. And I will talk in my next lecture about hypotonic hyponatremia because it is a topic on its own. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. For more medical videos, please visit us at www.drpaul.org and take time to browse through hundreds of health videos we regularly post on our site. If you are preparing for USMLE, PLAB, and other medical exams, make sure you visit our website to browse through our videos explaining the essential points you need to know before taking these examinations. For more information, visit us at www.drpaul.org. Thank you, and may God richly bless you.